Okay, fantastic. So we'll start with our first presentation by uh, Dr. Leah. So feel free to share your screen and I'll set the timer once you get going. Thank you. Hi everyone, I wanna make sure that you see everything okay on my end. Um, thank you so much for the introduction um, and uh, uh, just an <laughs> announcement, I guess, and a, 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 um, and a clarification. I'm no longer at Mississippi State University, uh, but I, when we started this project, I was I was there at the, um, at the time. Uh, very excited to present our work uh, with the Anne Arundel County Election Office in Maryland and um, uh, David, who's the director, uh, he's going to get the project started and introduce um, and then I will take over. So David, when you're ready, you can jump in. Absolutely. Uh, good. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting us to be here. Uh, my name is David Garris. I'm the director of the Anne Arundel County Board of Elections. I uh, to give you a little background. We're uh, a uh, county outside of Washington, D.C. We're about 400,000 registered voters. Uh, we're about the fifth largest county in the state of Maryland. And the state of Maryland uh, is about the size of Belgium, if you wanted the, uh, the European equivalent. Uh, so this project is about voter engagement and voter satisfaction, um, looking at it from a, from a more uh, logistical standpoint. Uh, from our perspective, elections have many, many stakeholders, uh, including, of course, the uh, candidates, the uh, campaigns, um, our election workers, us on the election boards. Uh, but one of the things that we wanted to make sure is that we were getting the uh, input and information from our voters, uh, who we look at as the customers. So we wanted to make sure that, and check into our voter experience to make sure that it was as uh, it was satisfying the needs of our voters. Uh, if you wanna move to the next slide. What we decided to do um, to test this or to figure out where we could help is to uh, create a study um, for voter engagement. And what we wanted to check is how can we measure the voter satisfaction with the experience of voting itself, um, not necessarily with the candidates or with any of the other outside pieces of the process, but specifically the administration. How can we make that process where you go into the either a polling place uh, to vote as uh, a, as a satisfying and you know stress free, worry free as possible, uh, or how do we? allocate our resources because in a government uh, agency, resources are always limited. They're always limiting funding, time, and staff. How can we allocate our limited resources to best uh, accommodate our voters uh, via putting more resources toward drop boxes, improving the drop box experience by implementing new technology, improving the mail-in ballot experience by perhaps uh, investigating new ways to uh, manage and process mail-in ballots, think ways to do it faster, ways to do it uh, more accurately or more efficiently, or ways to engage the, um, the voters so that they get the information that they need, like when was their ballot received by the office, when was the ballot counted by the office, ways that we can make that process better for all the voters, um, and way, things that we can learn that we can apply not just to Anne Arundel County, Maryland, but also to the state itself. And then as we go and learn, uh, what can we take and, and what can we take and apply for uh, to other locations? And then what uh, what information will this, uh, does this engagement study uh, give us that will uh, will encourage different avenues of study, different topics and different things that we can, uh, that we can investigate? And how can we can bring more empiricism um, and analysis to the voter uh, voter satisfaction piece of the election process. Oh, so with that, I'll turn things over to Leah. Thank you. It looks like you might be muted. Yes, I am. Thank you. So as David said, the goal is to overall to improve the what we could describe as a voter experience, uh, thinking of voters as you know customers, uh, but in a, in a more um, in a more interpersonal way. Um, and uh, one approach to understanding the voter experience is to do a survey. Uh, one of the benefits in working with election officials, at least in the United States, is that we get to have access to um, individual level information. So what we call the voter records. Um, and one of the major partners on this project, aside from Anne Arundel County, Maryland, is Towson University's Empowering Secure Elections Lab. 
specifically professors Natalie Scale and Josh Dellinger, with uh, one uh, student that uh, assisted on the project, Sadie Barrett. I teamed up um, with them uh, based on my experience in the election space um, and in utilizing surveys uh, designed to capture election administration and voter satisfaction. And we, uh, the Towson University has a strong relationship with Anne Arundel County, so it was an obvious partner for this project. So, the, the the lab has uh, had prior interactions and projects with Anne Arundel County, so it's one of the leader, leaders in the state in doing election research and integrating findings into election administration practices. Some of the most recent projects that had, they have worked together is uh, poll worker training modules, um, uh, assisting the county in submitting um, innovations for recognition by uh, the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, the Clearinghouse Awards, which is a very big deal in, in the United States. Um, and, and as I said, Anna Rundell is one of the innovators uh, across the United States and in Maryland in improving the election, elections and the voter experience. So the key considerations here is how do we leverage the voter records, what information we have, and what can we use to understand the voter experience better. Voter records in Maryland and in Anne Arundel County um, have uh, the voter registration status, whether one is registered and whether they're active or inactive, um, where they're at which polling place they are assigned if they are to vote in person at a physical polling place, their voting history, whether they had voted in recent elections, and their voting method, whether they have voted in person or by mail. Um, so the, the, it's very rich in what kind of information we can get, and it's the actual voter record. So it's not self-reported voter uh, behavior and voter history. And we have experience with um, survey research and with collaborating with election officials. So that's where this collaboration um, took over. So it was very difficult when we're thinking about how we can survey this population. Um, the, and of course, cost being one of the major considerations, we opted for a survey, an online survey using registered voters who have already volunteered their email address. Of course, there is their um, considerations about who is more likely to provide this kind of information and how different they are from the overall voter registrants. Uh, but we, you know, working with the confounds of what we had, we opted uh, with an online survey with emails. So. Uh, among the uh, over 40,000, uh, 400,000 uh, registered voters, we had 194,000, over uh, about 195,000 voters with emails. And that was our population of interest. That was a sample that we used for the survey. Um, as you can see, we had a very low response rate and we can talk about these challenges. Um, and among the 3,000 that responded, we had about 1.4% of usable responses, meaning they were complete and were able to use them to understand the voter experience a little better. Some of the questions that we used for this survey, um, we asked uh, voters to verify their social demographics, their disability status, because disability voters are uh, among the uh, electoral group with that are traditionally underserved in across the United States. Um, recent voting history that we could verify with the voter records, uh, which, which method they used in the most recent elections, and ending the survey with a question about civic service, whether you are interested in serving as a poll worker. Uh, specific questions for the voting experience, we tailored, um, we wanted to capture different dynamics in the in-person voting experience, how long one waited in line, whether they had difficulty finding their polling place, what voting equipment issues they may have had, voters who opted to vote by mail, uh, whether they had difficulty requesting returning a ballot, return method they used, whether they used a postal service or a Dropbox. All of these are significant items for election officials because they um, help understand which services are can, can be improved and how voters experience those services. And of course, very much interest is how voters uh, perceive the integrity of the election process, whether they're confident that their ballot will count, uh, they're confident that ballots in their county or their state is going to count. This is very relevant in the United States and across the world as you know, misinformation and disinformation is, is, uh, has a negative impact on overall perceptions about uh, ballot integrity and confidence that ballots are counted. 
Um, and uh, uh, for this survey, we drew from one of the most established surveys in the U.S. space, the survey of the performance of American elections. It's one it's in Spay, not safe. I'm sorry for the typo. This is a survey that really captures what we call the voter experience and election administration questions. So we drew from that survey to build this one. I'm going a little bit faster. I want to make sure we're okay with time. So we have a lot of data uh, that we shared with uh, the Anne Arundel County Board of Elections. This is just a snapshot of the things that we uh, we reported um, to the county to um, um, describe this uh, uh, the, the electorate, again, based on the responses we received from a small subsample of the registry that had an email and from them an even smaller subsample. Um, we have an interesting variation um, uh, based on party and method of voting. One of the most obvious things that we can see from the figure is that uh, voters, uh, there's a, a clear partisan split in who is uh, more predisposed to vote by mail. For those of you who are following or even not following US elections, recent elections, we have that the mail voting method has been politicized with um, um, candidates from the Republican Party casting doubt on the security of the mail ballot process. So we see clear uh, cue taking from voters with um, Democrats being more likely to uh, cast uh, a mail ballot and that that mirrors a behavior across the nation. Uh, but interesting differences by party on who voted by mail and who voted in person and overall uh, voters who opted which methods. Now, one of the important uh, questions that we asked is finding one's polling place. Again, in the context of the United States, polling places can often change. Sometimes voters are not aware of what their polling place is. In some cases, uh, in other jurisdictions, they may not have enough information to find it. So it is very um, inter of interest for the election officials to know whether voters have challenges in finding their polling place. And of course, this is reassuring in Anna Rundle County that among the respondents, the registered voters who responded to the survey, they reported that it's very easy or fairly easy to find their polling place. Of course, there were few that reported that it's somewhat difficult or very difficult. And although it is a very small proportion of the respondent, it's still of interest to understand why there are voters who still reported facing challenges and how we can improve that experience. So moving on to the mail-in or absentee uh, voting, uh, there are many reasons why voters vote absentee and every state has the different rules to allow for absentee or mail voting. Those are terms can be used sometimes interchangeably. Um, here we report the breakdown of responses by party, um, something that is very, very interesting and important in the context of Maryland and other states is the ability of a, a registered voter to receive the ballot automatically, so not having to request it or not having to submit an excuse to request an absentee ballot, so it's clear that this is a policy that helps uh, voters and it makes the process of requesting easier. Uh, and convenience. So this reaffirms of the, the the usefulness of this voting method and how it works for voters in Anne Arundel County. And uh, there are different reasons also that voters um, um, volunteer as to why they choose to vote by mail. And they're not, you know, they're very straightforward. You know, some are, con are, con are concerned about COVID. Others, they were out of town, so they were not able to vote in person on election day. Therefore, this is this is of relevance because it really uh, sh um, showcases how this voting method um, serves the voters and it makes it convenient for them. Um, Again, there are, many, there are a lot of information that, that we gather from the survey, and those are some, some, some top findings here. Um, of interest is also uh, whether voters feel confident that their votes, uh, personally, their votes uh, are counted as intended. And um, in the context of the United States, there is a lot of variation of confidence, you know, based, of course, on party, but also based on their experiences, based on their uh, racial and demographic characteristics. Here we report this breakdown um, confidence that my own vote counted as intended in the most recent election. For many voters, that was 2022 or 2020. Um, and we can see overall high uh, confidence rates across all levels with the one um, caveat, Pacific, those who identified as Pacific Islanders were significantly less um, 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 likely to report that they, uh, they expressed confidence that their vote counted. So of course, this is a finding of interest is overall reassuring that overall confidence is high. Many, uh, the majority of respondents, <clears throat> excuse me, said they're very confident or somewhat confident. But of course, when we're thinking in the context of 
who is underserved and why and how we can improve the experience for everyone. What kind of services should we uh, inter introduce or amend to improve that experience for everyone? It is very interesting to look at those differences across those different demographics. Um, I will talk a little bit about the limitations and I would really like David for you to jump in and, and, and reflect a little bit as an election official on how you know this information has been useful, uh, if at all, and we hope that it is for Anne Arundel County. Uh, obviously response rates, that's a major issue. We capture a very small uh, proportion of registered voters and those who volunteer their email. So there's a whole research area of who is more likely to volunteer that information as part of their voter registration record and how they're different from those who haven't, how can we capture responses and attitudes of all registered voters and how can we holistically improve that voter experience for everyone. And given that there are costs associated with this kind of uh, research. Um, and <clears throat> one other challenge that we, we anticipate having is that the survey was fielded long after the 2022 election. It is likely that voters kind of you know, romanticize their experiences. You know, they might have uh, waited longer at the polls. They might have had difficulties, but thinking, you know, uh, further later, like, well, it wasn't that a big deal overall. I had a good experience. So capturing those perhaps in the uh, immediate aftermath of an election might be more accurate and maybe to be checking afterwards for those uh for those attitudes, that's something that we can consider, but of course we are constrained with our resources that we have. Leah, just to quickly note, we've hit the 15 minute mark, but if you just would like maybe 30 seconds to quickly wrap up, we'd- Okay, happy. thank you. Yeah, David. Sure, uh, just, to, uh, just to reiterate with what Leah had said, that this gives us a baseline. This gives us an empirical place to start. Um, we want to bring empiricism and rationality into the creation of election policies and procedures. It can be a very emotional field. It can be something where people they get they get hot with their with uh, policies and procedures and they get very passionate about it. But this can maybe be a way to to take bias and uh, some of those kind of factors out of the decision making process for providing election services to the voters. Um, and it could also, like say, help us identify places where there are different populations and what their needs are. Uh, in the last slide, with the urban, rural split, suburban and exurban, uh, there are a lot of different uh, different locations, different ways people make their lives. And how can we accommodate all of them to make sure that everybody uh, has their voice heard uh, during the elections? So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you both for your presentation. That was super interesting. And uh, I hope we have a lot of good questions for you at the question period later. So we'll continue with our second presentation by uh, Tom Masillo. So Tom, if you'd like to put up your PowerPoint, we can get going on that. And just a, run, a, run, a reminder, I'll send you like a message at the two minute mark. Great. Um... So let's see, can you see my? I did see it, but it just disappeared. Okay, <laughs> sorry, yeah, there. Okay, excellent. Okay. Well, thank you everybody. Um, I am moving my screens around here, sorry. There we go. Um, great, so my paper, um, uh, thanks uh, in advance here to uh, to Tom for reading and for the organizers uh, um, for putting this conference together. Um, the The title of my paper there is um, it's about um, in the subtitle you can see is really the main thrust how how high voting costs can drive policy extremism. So I'm interested in political polarization in that sense. And and the, the the main part of the title there, alienated abstainers and polarized parties, sort of um, gets at um, what I'll be talking about in a little bit. Um, basically, the, the effect of 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 of, of alienated, um, you know, abstaining voters and and how how they drive um, sort of the dynamics of party competition. Um, the paper here is a bit of a change of pace. It's it's a, you know it's a theoretical paper. Uh, um, um, we've heard a lot of case and contextual um, projects, great stuff. Um, I hope you can approach this with a kind of a disposition like of pluralism um, uh, open to this, this kind of way of uh, knowing things as well. It's, um, it's really, it's, it uses computer simulations, um, computational model 
to uh, to simulate voting and um, and parties. Um, the bad news is that these papers, um, these projects and models use a lot of math. Uh, the behaviors are guided by you know equations and algorithms. Um, I've avoided, I've I'll mostly avoid them here almost completely. Um, the good news is that they also use a lot of images and um, figures um, to to convey their messages, and so um, I'll focus on that um, that here. Um, here in this, and you know, on my title slide here, I just kind of give you some screenshots of the the simulation, the the world that uh, you know I sort of created here. Um, on the left-hand panel, you see what you see there is you're sort of looking at a, a two-dimensional policy space, um, which is to say, like along the left-right axis in that picture, you might think about economic um, positions, left and right, like big government, you know, on the left uh, versus um, you know low taxes, small government on the right, and then in the in the x in the y dimension, you might consider like a separate kind of issue space, like say social issues. So you could be conservative or progressive on, on say social issues. Um, so, so that's sort of the space, uh, the policy space that's represented here. The, um, the kind of the, the colors and the black there um, are, are, are where voters are distributed. So this is basically like looking down on a, um, a collection of voters there in those little patches with the different colors. Um, and it's kind of brighter in the middle to represent that this is like a normal distribution. Like we're assuming that voters are distributed normally in this policy space with, in this case, kind of a lot of centrists, right? And, and fewer and fewer um, people um, in, in locations, policy locations far from the center, okay? And then those little, um, those little arrows uh, represent the parties. And, and I'll talk more about all of this, of course, in just a minute, but I just wanted to get the picture up here. Uh, and the parties kind of move around this policy space trying to win voters. And um, so the the vote, the voters, the patches with the colors represent, you know, um, which party uh, they're voting for. So the red voters are voting for the red arrow party, okay, and the brown ones with the with the brown arrow. On the left, so they're they're basically identical images, except that on the left, everybody's participating. And on the right hand side, um, turnout is low. There's there's high voting costs. Okay, and I'll talk about that more in just a minute. Okay, so this is just um, just kind of a to get you um, oriented to the to the framework um, that's 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 um, that's operating here. All right. So the question I have in the project is um, is is about the relationship between voting costs and political polarization. How do high voting costs influence political polarization? Um, so the outcome then is really, um, uh, I'm sorry, the, 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 the predictor, the input to this whole thing is about voting costs. Um, what, uh, what do obstacles, um, uh, by which I mean sort of obstacles to participation um, in, in the electoral process? And um, you know, we just heard a, 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 um, a heard, heard a, a great presentation about the, the rich detail that that might kind of imply. And and in this case, I'm kind of glossing over that detail, right? And just thinking generically about voting costs. So you know, how hard is it to get registered? How hard is it to uh, to show up for elections? In certain countries, of course, there's compulsory voting, um, and that's sort of like a the opposite of a voting cost, right? It's costly not to vote. So those are the kinds of issues that I'm interested in. Another um, kind of voting cost example might be um, kind of the, the costs associated with kind of getting informed, right, about, about how you're gonna participate in an election. So I'm interested in voting costs. And on the outcome side, I'm interested in, in political polarization. Um, on average, uh, how far are political parties from the, the center, from the median voter, okay? Um, and in this, in this paper, in this project, that, that, that means something kind of particular, right? It, it, it means a, it's a policy space, a two-dimensional policy space. So it, it means policy extremism, okay? There's other, you know, in political science, we have other kind of conceptualizations of what polarization might mean. Um, and Andreas Schedler just wrote a great paper kind of distinguishing these these two types. One is sort of this anti-regime kind of um, kind of deep conflict um, um, in society, 
in behavioral kind of literatures like Russ Dalton's paper, uh, it's it's more often associated with just policy differences, like big policy differences versus small ones. So that is the um, the the high level kind of summary of what what I'm I'm going after. If if we were to kind of um, a, a transport this into a case kind of context, um, you might think about the UK Elections Act of 2022, which Toby um, helpfully uh, pointed pointed me to a, a few months ago. Um, you might say, uh, you know, applying this model to that case, you might say, do voter ID requirements, uh, the, the, the UK Elections Act of 22, 2022 made voter ID um, uh, a, new, a new requirement in the UK in order to vote. So you can't just show up and state who you are. Um, you have to, you know, bring a photo ID. And, um, and that you might think of as a, as a cost to voting because getting hold of these photo IDs might, might be, um, you know, it imposes some difficulties, maybe not a big one, depends perhaps on who you are. But in any case, um, the question would be, does that kind of a requirement it, uh, lead to uh, more or less pol political polarization? Does it change what parties do? Um, the voter ID requirement here is, uh, is, is, is thought of as an obstacle to voting. Um, and then, um, and then the question would be like, how do how do parties adapt in the face of of this obstacle to voting? In the face of what voters might do, in particular, in in, in face of abstention from voters. Okay, so um, the the this paper I'm presenting today, it's just one piece. It's this first piece. It's the theoretical model of 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 the part of the project. Um, uh, another another part of the project that I'm kind of in now, I wanted to share some today, but I didn't quite make enough um, progress on it. Um, it's 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 a it's a piece of the project that involves validating, you know, with with real world data, the the findings of the model. Um, and and in this piece of the project, what I'm doing is collecting cross national um, comparative data over time and examining kind of national level associations between voting costs and party polarization and other features, of course, of, of politics um, that, that I have to control for. And in a third part of the, of the research program, um, I'm also looking to, again, it's, a, it's kind of a, an empirical um, part of the project. I'm, I'm looking to validate the model, the mechanisms in the model, and I'm gonna do that through case studies. Um, I, in particular, I want to show, you know, how voting costs lead to abstention, who abstains, and in light of abstention, what do political parties do? Okay, how do they adapt their policy positions? So I, I'm, I'm looking for a case, perhaps the UK case, um, to think about how a new voting cost or, or the reduction of a voting cost might change the behaviors. Does, does the world react in the way my model suggests it will? Okay, so that's the overall program program. I'll focus on the first point today. So I guess in, in, in political science, in, in, the, in the literature uh, that I'm working within here, this, this project is very much related to the, you know, the, the, the somewhat famous uh, median voter theorem, right? Um, in the median voter theorem, Downs's theorem, um, the, the model shows that when you have two political parties and one policy dimension, policy made it uh, and your voters are policy motivated and there are no voting costs, what happens is parties converge to the median voter. Okay, there's basically no polarization. They, they, um, they, um, they, they, they move to where the, 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 um, the kind of the, uh, the average voter is, the, the median voter is. Um, this is all kind of done with math and 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 formal theories. And um, the the problem is that if you try to complicate this kind of model um, with more parties, like three or four or ten, or more policy dimensions, or other kinds of features that kind of make it resemble the world, um, the real world, uh, more closely, it becomes sort of. Uh, kind of non, they, they, one would say analyt analytically intractable. You can't really solve these equations. So that's why people turn to these simulations because you could enrich the world somewhat by adding more parties, more policy dimensions of different kinds of um, parties and, and voters. So th that work was done by um, Mick Laver and Ernest Sergenti in 2012. They wrote a book, great book called Party Competition. 
And then um, I'm adding this piece. What happens if citizens face obstacles to voting? Because they've all assumed before this that there are no voting costs, all right? So um, there's there's two main actors in the project. Um, they're the citizens, and they have a they have a policy preference. You would say they have to take a position on these two dimensions. And in my in my case here, I'm imposing a, a cost to voting. Okay, so I don't say what it is. Um, um, it's it's an abstraction. But but you know you sign sort of you might you might think like a dollar sign to it. Okay. Um, and these models are dynamic, so things change in time. And so at each tick of the clock, um, if, if their policy benefit from the parties they see is greater than the cost of voting, if they stand to gain more than the cost of voting, they're going to vote. Otherwise, they're going to abstain. Okay, so that's the, that's the, that's the citizen. They, they face basically two decisions. They, they kind of evaluate where the parties are and pick their favorite and decide like how... What are the stakes for them individually? And then they decide, secondly, whether or not they'll participate or not. For parties, um, they are, in this case, kind of, uh, we assume that they're vote-seeking hunters. They just, they just tick to tick, time to time, they're just looking to increase their vote share. So they're, they're, move, they're changing their policy slightly each, each uh, election tick to find more voters. If they find more voters by taking a step in one particular direction, they keep going that direction. If they lose voters, they try something new. They kind of turn around and change direction somewhat randomly to, to find a new, a new direction to take a step, okay? So they make small changes each election or each, you know, each period and um, try to increase their vote. Okay, so it's sort of conceptualized as a dance, like, like they're reacting to each other, okay? The parties are looking for votes, voters are looking for policy preferences, they sometimes abstain, as voters abstain, parties might need to go somewhere else and the, and the cycle sort of continues. Um, there's basically four scenarios I'll focus on today. Um, low costs with two parties, the literature before us, the median voter theorem namely, has shown that that leads to low polarization. Low costs with many parties um, uh, increases polarization, okay? So without any, when everyone votes, more parties lead to more, more distributed parties around the space. Um, what happens is my question is when, when we have, um, you know, high voting costs, does that change where the parties kind of land? And I'll just, you know, real fast here, um, I think I'm running out of time. I want to get to my results. But let me just show you um, what this looks like. There's there's a lot going, this is the interface for the, for the, um, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm seeing a chat here. I'm one minute remaining. How long ago was that? Okay. So um, let me just show you what it looks like when you run it. Here's two parties with low costs when you go. When you click go, they move around, and this you know chart over here measures the the location of the two parties relative to the center. Okay, um, we could change it. We could increase voting costs and and go, and and then we measure again what is the level of polarization. All right, so let me wrap up by saying that um, you know the results just summarized super briefly. Um, here, as you increase voting costs, no voting costs on the darkest blue lines, highest voting costs with the light blue lines, you can see that turnout declines. Okay, that's not surprising. We, we expect that to happen. The question I want to answer is like, well, what do parties do in response to that environment? And this chart on the x-axis shows the number of political parties, so a two-party system um, like the U.S would be down here on the left and many party system like say Brazil would be on the on the right hand side of that image. And on the Y axis, we have the measure of polarization. So let me just compare two scenarios um, on the left in a two party system. As voting costs increase from the dark line, low costs to the high, you know, high cost light blue line, the average location of parties gets more extreme. On the other hand, um, when there's many parties, the opposite happens. 
as you increase voting costs, the parties kind of move towards the center from where they had previously been. All right, so I'm going to skip ahead to my um, um, just uh, conclusion, which is to say that my next steps are to gather data to validate these relationships. And the policy implication um, would be that, um, you know, um, you could reduce polarization by building broadly participatory uh, political systems. Thanks very much. Awesome. Thank you, Tom. And this is great theoretical work, and I'm excited to see it out at some point once you get more into it. Um, so we'll move to the uh, third and final presentation. So Rachel and uh, Zarish, if you can share, this, share your screen and uh, get going. I'll just a reminder, I'll send either both of you or one of you the two minute, uh, I'll send both of you the two minute uh, mark once we get there. Perfect, thank you. Awesome. All right, so I don't know if I can see the full, can you go back to the title slide? I'll just introduce our presentation. So we're presenting on the regional dynamics of trust, um, and we're going to be showing and discussing our spatial analysis of electoral trust in Canada using some of our data. Um, and my colleague Zarish and I will be presenting it, and our colleague Asif, who's in the audience, is also um, helped in this work. So to go to the next slide, this next one will just show you an outline of our presentation, um, straightforward. and. So we're talking here about the regional and spatial distribution of trust. So in regionalism, of course, that theory holds that there's variance across the country, which includes in trust and confidence in institutions. And also in the literature, regionalism in Canada has been primarily taken up at the provincial and territorial level. Um, so can you just, I can't see the full, oh, sorry, I'm so sorry, Never mind. I was just, anyway, I'm going to go on. Um, so it's been taken up mostly at the provincial and territorial level, and we're going to be looking at a more granular level, which I'll talk more about moving uh, in my next uh, slides. And one thing that we want to consider here as well is the neighborhood effect, which is the concept of location being a predictor of elector behavior. Um, that's something that could also be understood further in Canada. And another thing that we wanted to do when trying to profile trust is to make sure that we consider neighborhood as a confounding variable and we've tried to also separate it out in some of our analyses to understand um, the effect of neighborhood effect independently and also perhaps of other variables independently of the neighborhood effect. Next slide, please. So we also know that income inequalities in a society are a predictor of trust, but, uh, but most existing work has focused on income inequality and not other types of inequality. And also there have been contradictory findings around inequality in any case where they can increase or decrease trust. Um, so primarily one thing that's been written about a little bit is that if inequalities in a society are evaluated as fair, then trust actually increases. And so all of these tensions and questions are very interesting to investigate further, which is what we've tried to do a little bit in this project. Um, and we are looking at inequalities or deprivation as a predictor of trust. And the word deprivation comes from the multiple deprivation index, which is uh, something we've used as an analytical framework. And I'll talk a bit more about after. But when I say deprivation, I'm referring to inequalities and I'm referring to them in the context of the multiple deprivation index. So does deprivation or inequality predict trust independent of spatial or regional variables? And if so, what kinds of inequality predict trust? Those are the questions we're trying to answer. So to discuss a little bit about the Canadian Index of Multiple Deprivation, this was an index developed by Statistics Canada in order to summarize area level deprivation and marginalization. Uh, you can see a summary of it in this figure that's hopefully big enough for everyone to kind of read. Um, but the index uses area-based and geographically derived indexes of deprivation along these four dimensions you see here. So that's residential instability, ethnocultural composition, economic dependency, and situational vulnerability. And each of those are made up of some sub-indices. Um, and the, these indicators were derived at the dissemination area level, which is the smallest standard geographic area um, for, for census data. 
And we combined our data to the dissemination area level as well, so that we could do a more granular spatial analysis of the key covariates of trust that is both more granular than the kind of provincial and territorial level I mentioned, and also matches uh, the Canadian index of multiple deprivation. So the trust measure that we've used is this question from our 2021 national electors study. Um, it asks uh, respondents what level of trust they have in the accuracy of election results in their riding. And the response options here are shown. So we removed the don't know response from our analyses, but the other responses are very high, somewhat high, somewhat low, and very low. Uh, and just to visualize the our regional unit, unit, which is dissemination areas, or it also matches to electoral boundaries, um, you can just see those pictured. And another thing to keep in mind before we go into the analyses is that it's these are not conclusions or analyses generalizable beyond the survey participants, and also that there is a response bias, particularly in a survey like the NES that this data is taken from, where it's more likely that respondents will have been voters um, than non-voters. And so that's something to also keep in mind. I'll hand it over to Zarish to continue. Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Um, okay, so our main objective with this analysis was to get a more nuanced understanding of how trust varies across Canada. Um, so in, in order to do so, I'll first take you through a visual mapping of trust across different regions of Canada, showing you where trust seems to be stronger and where it might need some fortifying. Uh, next, I'll show you that the variation we're seeing is backed up with statistical evidence. Um, so I'll quantify how much neighbors look like each other using more and size statistics. And then I'll group together regions that look similar to their neighbors, identifying areas where low trust or high trust is clustered together using hotspot analysis. Um, and finally, I'll show you results from a first attempt to try to move beyond a descriptive understanding to a more predictive understanding of how inequality might be related to trust. Um, and I'll do this by using the multi multiple deprivation index that Rachel just spoke about to see whether we can model the variation in trust through those indices whilst also controlling for the spatial correlations that are present. Um, so before we look at trust regionally, to give you an overall idea of what trust looks like, here's the distribution of responses. The average trust score was 3.67 on a scale from one to four. So trust is generally pretty high. And the graph here shows that distribution averaged over electoral districts. Um, and as expected, most of the districts are on the higher end of the trust scale and a few and fewer electoral writings reported lower trust levels. But there are people within these electoral districts uh, reporting scores of one or two, which is low trust. So even though it ranges from three to four, there are people who report one or two. Um, so for example, this is an electoral district in Saskatchewan, which had a mean trust score of 3.59. But as you can see, people within the districts reported low trust uh, in electoral results, even though the majority reported high trust. What I want to note here is that since this is an ordinal variable, a score of 3.59, for example, just means that there are more participants within an ED that reported lower scores. Okay, so moving on to spatial mapping, we can lay out the variations in trust I was just speaking about across Canada's map, district by district. And the idea here is to be able to point to, at a more granular level, where trust is most and least pronounced and how it changes. Um, the map here is color coded to depict the average trust scores and the accuracy of election results. Light colors depict um, lower scores and dark colors depict higher scores. And the range of colors from light to dark corresponds to average trust scores from three to four. And as you can see, there are many electoral districts that are darker, which is um, consistent with our earlier observations of generally high trust scores. But it's the lighter shades that really draw our attention. Um, so we can see in more geographically remote regions in BC, Alberta, and Quebec, there are lower levels of trust. We also see this urban-rural divide that becomes clearer when you zoom in. Um, Montreal over here seems to have higher trust than its surrounding regions, whereas districts get farther from the city center, they exhibit lighter shades, indicating lower trust. And this is Ottawa uh, over here, which shows a similar pattern. And these observations are consistent with um, existing research. For example, a report by the Public Policy Forum showed that 72% of rural respondents believe that the government doesn't care about them, compared to 63.9% of urban respondents. 
Um, another example of interest that I'll show you is if you zoom in on Winnipeg here, the districts that are dark red are the south end, which con and these constitute the more affluent areas of the city compared to the surrounding orange regions. And this hints at affluence being a potential factor contributing to trust levels. So I'm being somewhat speculative with these examples and I'm showing observational results. So to make these spatial variations less observational, we ran more in Xi statistics to measure the spatial autocorrelation or um, to see how much regions look similar to their neighbors um, and to see whether that variation is statistically significant. Uh, so this graph here shows the overall result of how similar districts are to their neighbors on trust. The x-axis here is the trust score for each district and the y-axis is a similar value, but this time it's the average trust score for all of the neighboring districts. Um, and overall, we see a positive trend. The upper trend of this uh, red line indicates that there is indeed a pattern where districts tend to be similar to their neighbors in terms of trust. Um, so districts that have high trust are more likely to have neighbors with high trust as well and vice versa. So now that we have evidence that in general neighbors look like each other, we can map this out to see whether we can group these regions together. Um, this is what I've done here to see how this variability changes across the map. I've plotted the local Morin's eye, which maps out how similar an, ele an electoral district is to its neighbors. So areas shaded in green are um, where areas have similar trust scores to their neighbors and uh, a regional homogeneity in trust scores. And on the other hand, areas in yellow to beige indicate heterogeneity or areas where trust levels vary more dramatically. And so what I'm showing you here are similarity scores, but they don't really show you whether they're similar in that they all both have or all have low trust or that they have high trust. Um, so here I've characterized that similarity into hotspots and cold spots of high and low trust scores. And I'm only showing those regions which were statistically significant in how much they resembled their neighbors. Um, the red areas here are cold spots where districts with lower levels of trust are surrounded by other districts with lower levels of trust. The blue uh, that you can see here denotes regions where districts with high trust are adjacent to other districts with high trust. And the yellow and purple clusters are areas of contrast. Um, the purple you can't really see here, but you can see when you zoom in on smaller electoral districts. Uh, but purple areas would show areas with low trust surrounded by districts that have high trust and yellow areas are the opposite they have high trust but their neighbors have low trust for example northern manitoba over here seems to score higher in trust than its neighboring regions so one of the reasons for this mapping is of course to understand the variation of trust for policy and outreach implications but it can also be relevant in explaining what factors might be leading to this variation in trust and if there is variation across dissemination areas or electoral districts, any predictions that we make about what factors might influence trust should take that variation into account. So our next step then was to see whether we could predict the variations in trust using the multiple deprivation index. Um, just as a reminder, our predictors were the four indices, residential instability, ethnocultural composition, economic dependency, and situational vulnerability. And each of these indices are made up of several variables that have also been spatially indexed. Uh, we ran a logistic Bayesian regression where trust was the dependent variable and the four predictors were the four uh, multiple deprivation indices. Uh, we also included a random intercept for um, each dissemination area. So this means that each dissemination area could have its own baseline level of trust and the model could capture that unobserved heterogeneity as well. And because uh, trust in general is known to be relatively high and we have a skewed distribution. So for the priors, we chose a normal skewed, skewed normal distribution um, and, a norm and somewhat uninformative priors for the coefficient and spatial factors. Okay, so here are our, our results. I'm, what I'm showing you are the posterior distributions for the four predictors where the x-axis represents the coefficients of the model and the y-axis um, is each of the indices. And as we can see, uh, economic dependency and ethnocultural composition are not different from zero, suggesting that changes in them aren't associated with changes in trust in electoral results. Um, we see a small increase in residential instability um, it seems to have a significant, but it's still small. Um, however, an increase in situational vulnerability shows the largest effect, where an increase in situational vulnerability is associated with a significant decrease in trust. Um, so the coefficient of situational vulnerability was negative 0.35. 
in our model. Um, and translating this into more tangible terms, this means that for each one unit increase in situational vulnerability, the estimated odds of reporting a lower level of trust, so for example, from very high to somewhat high or somewhat high to somewhat low, are um, 0.7 times greater while holding all other variables constant. In comparison, the coefficient for uh, residential instability was only 0.05. Um, so I know odds ratios aren't super intuitive. Uh, to make this a bit clearer, we can take a closer look at the marginal effects of residential instability. It's clear that the effect is very small. There's a slight increase in the predicted probability of very high trust as residential instability increases and slight decreases in uh, somewhat high. Um, one reason the effect might be small might be that the factors that make up residential instability might be canceling each other out. Um, this is purely speculative. We plan to dissect these factors further to see if that's the case. Um, but when you do look at the conditional effects of situational vulnerability, the effects are quite a bit clearer, where low trust scores are more likely at the high end of situational vulnerability. Somewhat high trust scores in electoral results show moderate increases with increases in situational vulnerability. And as situational vulnerability increases, the likelihood of having very high trust decreases consistently. Um, with this, I'm going to give this off to Rachel to... Yeah, and I know we're almost out of time, so I'm just going to quickly go through some key takeaways. Um, so, of course, we've seen that trust in electoral results does vary across and within electoral districts, and Zarish has taken us a bit through more specifics of how much and, and specifically how. Um, but one major thing that we can take out of this too is that neighboring electoral districts do tend to have similar trust scores. Um, there's They're particularly similar in Northern Canada where there is generally low, tr lower trust. And in Southern Canada, it's more heterogeneous and also more urban areas tend to have higher trust. And then for the question of whether the multiple deprivation index is a useful framework for understanding or predicting trust, um, as Arish has mentioned, we can see that trust is strongly associated with situational vulnerability and um, weakly associated with residential instability. I will just read through the sub indices of them because um, now that we found that they're significant, especially situational vulnerability, situational vulnerability is made up of the proportion of the population identified as indigenous proportion of population aged 25 to 64 without a high school diploma, proportion of homes needing major repairs, median income, proportion of single parent families, and median dollar value of dwelling. So these are kind of things that would be interesting to investigate further. Um, and yeah, so I mean, I think those are our conclusions. And I know that we're out of time. So I'll close it off here. Thank you so much for uh, listening to our presentation. And I think our contact info is on the last slide if you would like to reach out at all. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you to both of you for your presentation. That's uh, really cool work that NEMB is doing on trust. So we'll move to the last part of our presentations before getting into the question and answer period. So Tom, if you are ready for your roles discussant, uh, you can start off whenever you're ready. And I'll, I'll message you at the two minute mark um, after 15 minutes. Or, 30 minute mark. Perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, three great presentations, I think. Um, and they all kind of complemented each other in nice ways, actually. So I think there's a lot of kind of learnings almost you can get from each other in a way. Um, but I'll go in the order they were presented in. Um, so starting with the first one on voter engagement satisfaction, um, I think it was, yeah, really interesting. And obviously, you've got a really rich data source with the voter validated um data um and i think the first thing that would kind of come or came to mind for me was obviously you're talking a lot about those people who voted and that's great right but the assumption is they're kind of already engaged with the system so i wonder if you could reflect on and if you have plans to kind of how do you go about reaching those voters who aren't registered for instance um and do they kind of significantly differ from um, those who are? And um, and what is it about unregistered voters? Why are they not registered particularly? Um, is it kind of the registration system itself or kind of are there other barriers to that? Um, then I think it would be really nice um, 
maybe now, or if you were kind of disseminating this more widely, is to talk a bit about the county a bit more, kind of what does it look like? Is it kind of a bellwether American county? Does it kind of vote with how the presidential election goes? Is it safe Democrat, safe Republican, things like that? I think that would help really kind of contextualize your results a bit more. Um, yeah, and it would just help kind of understanding, are you seeing kind of this, uh, should we expect this to be a high level compared to other counties because it is a safe seat? Um, or should we expect a lower level because it is kind of a bellwether where there's a bit more competition um, at election time? Um, and then I just had a couple of questions um, or things you can expand on in your recruitment phase. Um, so you obviously mentioned that you had quite low response rate, which is kind of quite common across all surveys. Uh, the email you sent out, was it a one-time email or kind of were there follow-up to that to try and re-engage or to capture voters, say if they missed the first email or something? And or, and did you do any kind of follow-up work to kind of target specific groups of voters if they were kind of um, lacking in your sample initially? Um, and you mentioned it at the end, the survey timing, that it was quite um, away after the 22 um, uh, midterms. Um, so I wondered if kind of going forward, you had plans to do it again uh, this coming November, if you're planning to do it a bit closer, if you had thoughts on doing kind of a pre-election wave, kind of, um, yeah, asking voters kind of their um pre-election levels of trust and then kind of if you could recontact them then you could see after the election result did that level of trust change which kind of gives you a bit more um the ability to talk kind of causally and say well the results and what we did in the county affected trust in this way and you can really tap into some of these more causal mechanisms which i think could be um really interesting kind of for learnings and practices uh, and then i wondered if you had kind of um ideas or plans or thoughts about how you could link up with other local uh, counties or other places in in the US to say kind of, well, are the programs we're putting in place actually making that effect and kind of comparing results. So say, let's say you can um, collaborate with um, a neighboring county and you put in place kind of a measure to try and improve satisfaction, then testing that causally by running the survey in both counties, comparing results knowing that you've kind of done this intervention. Um, so that was kind of the comments I had for that one. Um, are we going to do responses now or all responses at the end? Sorry, I was, um, we can we can do responses at the end if you want to. Yep. Still, if you want. Okay. And then I'll go on to Tom's paper. Um, again, really interesting. Um, and it's nice to see kind of this more theoretical um, behavioral mod modeling stuff coming into it. And I think it definitely can complement it well. And it's nice to see, because um, I'm not, I think I might have missed it or it wasn't discussed in the paper about how you kind of aim to extend the project to apply it to the real world, which looks really nice. Um, so that was actually my biggest comment just from reading the paper, but you kind of covered that off, uh, which was good. Um, I just had a couple of questions kind of on some of the assumptions you're making in your modeling. So you talked about kind of um, these parties when you uh, simulate them, they're these hunters. Um, and I was wondering, so in the real world, there's kind of pull factors that exist that would say prevent a certain party moving too far on one axis. So have you looked at, or is it possible to kind of have these bounded hunters where they can't stray too far away from a certain point because that would in the real world look like them breaking kind of their ideological um guiding principles so it'd be say for instance um the uk green party moving towards reform that just kind of wouldn't happen um are you able to kind of put that into a model a bit where parties can't really like extreme switch over because that's obviously quite rare um and then you talk about kind of in terms of the number of parties, are you kind of considering like effective number of parties or is it or is it effective number of seat winning parties? I think just clearing up that definition would be quite nice. And then that kind of allows you to fit into that literature a bit better. Um, yeah. Uh, then. 
one thought I had when you were showing kind of the simulation in progress was so as you kind of increase the costs, the kind of groups get smaller and smaller and smaller around the arrowheads. Do you ever get a situation where kind of those right in the middle are just kind of left out or left behind? And then does that kind of have Im implications um, around, say, medium voters being left behind? They're kind of left out of the system and it's only these extreme voters voting for these extreme parties. Um, which could have quite interesting implications, I think. Yeah, and then, as I said, um, my main comment was about kind of the real world implications. Um, and I think in terms of literature, maybe you could lean into some of the polarization literature a bit more. Um, specifically, there was one paper I had in mind, which I can put in the chat, um, where we can kind of model how um, Uh, polarization and party systems kind of relate to each other and I think you kind of describe it a bit in your paper but it might be nice to kind of have a look at that bring that stuff in uh, to help with kind of the modeling of it um, and again it helps you link to those real world kind of cases um, so that was all the points I had for that one and then lastly um, so yeah, I think we know as on the academic side, we kind of, it's good that the ideas around kind, or well, not necessarily good, but the findings are validated that yes, deprivation and things like this do kind of hinder trust or in electoral systems. Um, and again, you kind of discussed it, this kind of urban rural split that is kind of perhaps a key driver of that. Um, so that was really interesting as well. Um, one thought I did have, so on your map where you mapped all the different districts and you said, well, we've got this urban rural split, obviously it wasn't perfect. So, and I was wondering what is it, what happens in these outlying districts where let's say it's a bit more rural, but they have a slightly high level of trust. Is it kind of the local election board? Are they doing something? Um, that another election board isn't doing to kind of maintain this trust, kind of what's happening there could be really interesting, I think, and I, kind of as a next step. Okay, so how do we improve trust? Where are these high trust um, or higher trust rural areas? Where are these lower trust urban areas and so on? Um, on the modelling, um, I think choosing a Bayesian framework is really interesting and good, um, but I was wondering why not a ordinal model? Um, why did you kind of go for that low jet setup? Um, just a justification that would be nice. Um, not that I, I, th I think it's fine, but just to kind of justify it. Um, and on your kind of nearest neighbor analysis, um, again, it links into this urban rural split that, well, what's happening in when neighbors do differ, um, what's happening kind of there. Um, and you talked about kind of your main outcome was obviously just trust in election results, but going back to the first presentation where they looked at kind of other things, um, so processes, do you kind of have plans to look at trust in processes as well as just pure results? Because obviously um, result uh, trust in results can be driven by whether or not your favoured party won or not. So I wondered if you had kind of any plans for that. And that was my kind of comments for all three papers. Happy to add clarification on any of those if it's needed. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you, Tom. And thank you for that very helpful feedback for the three um, presentations. So we have about four minutes left in the discussion panel. So. If each of the presenters want to maybe do one minute of feedback just to reply to Tom, and then we'll get into the Q and A if that works. So, um, David, if uh, if you'd like to give any responses to uh, to Tom's feedback, now's the time. Absolutely happy to. Uh, thank you for your comments. I thought those were a lot of great points. Um, so, how the regular voter? So the question of uh, the difference between the voters uh, who participate regularly and the non, uh, the voters who don't participate as frequently, that was actually a big discussion point uh, as we developed the survey. And it's one of the uh, 
one of the additional avenues for a uh, study that we want to uh, look into. Um, the you're right because we want to bring we want to bring in the voices of everyone that we can or as much of the communities we can in, st in a statistically significant way uh, so that we can make some uh, very uh, very solid judgments and decisions um, regarding comparative of the county to uh, either the bellwether counties of the of the country or of the state um, and doing comparative that's another great uh, great aspect part of uh, what our concept was was to use this maybe to create a program where uh, the state of Maryland itself or um, or coalition of counties um, could get together and periodically manage and check the way that uh, the way that our processes are being interpreted by the uh, by the public make sure that everybody or make sure as many people in the public uh, that do participate are satisfied with how things are and um, if they're not we address it quickly and um, you know uh, make sure that we're very responsive to all of our all of our voters so thank you awesome thank you so much david um tom if you'd like to jump in and respond to tom feel free sure thank you thank you tom for your comments um a lot of um you know good insights um you know that the idea that um that you propose that you know can you kind of anchor hunters to in some way um i guess um two kinds of responses to that um real quick one is that um you know one sort of dodge i don't know if it's artful or inartful but is that like you know at each time step um parties are adapting just by small policy position changes one step in the you know um what is it it's like um 70 uh it's it's 70 70 by 70 that that policy space so it's kind of huge so they're making small adaptations over time and and you know over time they could add up to to large policy changes but you know but but time to time tick to tick it, they're small changes so it's um that's that's one point uh, another is that like for sure, you can one of the one of the fun things about these models is that you can you can write algorithms that do all kinds of things. And, and that book that I mentioned by Laver and Sergenti, you know, kind of uh, includes a whole bunch of other party strategies. The reason I used hunters is because that's like that's the canonical sort of median voter theorem, like the, the most, uh, you know, it's the, it's the theoretical foundational idea. And and what I wanted to innovate on or introduce here was costly voting and um and, and see what happens so holding everything else kind of steady see what costly voting does so it has its disadvantages but that but that kind of a change that you mentioned could come later uh and in fact one of the fun things that um laver and jim fowler um somewhere out in california um did was um they had a competition and they allowed like people who do this kind of research to enter their own algorithms for party strategies to see who does best you know in competition with other strategies and over long periods um so anyway so that that's um that's a a place where all these things can be um enriched i guess you would say i should probably stop uh just on time but i noted your other points i'd love to answer them but maybe sidebar thanks Awesome. Thank you for your response. And uh, for, the, for our last presenters, uh, Rachel or um, Sarah, do you have a preference on who will respond? Uh, I can. I have some comments to start to make, if that's fine. And, and maybe I'll hand it over to Sarah. Uh, sure. Yeah. yeah. OK. If so, you can do it in one minute or two minutes, that'd be fantastic. Just so we can I'll try it. to be really quick. Just an awesome. overarching comment, yeah, is that it, it, that um, tension that you pointed out where there's like outliers to kind of trends we expect um where maybe the neighbors are different or for example it's rural but there's higher trust is exactly why we wanted uh, in the future perhaps to look into more of the sub indices for example of the deprivation index because as Arish men mentioned it's possible like some of those are canceling each other out or that there's other things going on um and so that's one thing that we would like to do, but also we would like to look at maybe some other parameters from our surveys because we only looked at one question that as um Tom correctly pointed out, of course, only asks about trust in uh, results, and it would be interesting to also include other survey questions and data 
and try to combine those things into analyses. Um, but because we just started with one question, we were kind of using this trust in results question as a proxy for trust in process, although they're of course not the same thing. And that's something that we definitely want to do in the future if we can. Um, and if Zarsh has anything to add, I'll hand it over. Yep. Um, so uh, agreed with what Rachel said. There's a lot more to examine in terms of the profiling of um, where neighborhoods are similar and dissimilar and where there's low and high trust. But I think that's what makes spatial analysis so interesting that you can point out those profiles. Um, but in terms of using a Bayesian framework, um, I think one of the main reasons is because we do have very, very, very skewed data. Um, so we wanted to incorporate a little bit of the prior information for that and also when we did the analysis, we were doing it by dissemination areas. Um, and that also uh, incorporates, there's smaller sample sizes in some dissemination areas than others. Um, and be, the Bayesian framework can deal with that better. And we can also have better posterior checks after we do that. Um, I hope that answers that. Awesome. Thank you both for responding. And uh, Tom, thank you again for your feedback.